So we just saw that there are multiple Nash equilibria in the one-shot game. You can sometimes get cooperation. However, to be clear, you don't always get cooperation, which is a very, very small tweak to that example. Cooperation is going to vanish. So I'll go back to the game between Megan and Richard. So I'll make this one little tweak. Before I had minus one, one for the payoff here. Now I'm gonna make that three. And it turns out that the modification is sufficient to bring down the cooperation. So let's start with our usual analysis. We do our best response analysis to find Nash equilibria. If Richard plays X, Megan's best response is A. Richard plays Y, Megan's best response is B. If Richard plays Z, Megan's best response is C. All right, our direction, if Megan plays A, Richard's best response is X. If Megan plays B, best response is Y. Best response to C is X. So Megan still likes that payoff CZ where she gets nine. She still looks to try to get Richard to cooperate. So let's say she takes the same approach as she did in the last example. So she makes the same kind of speech. If you play Z in round one, I will reward you by playing A in round two and I get the good Nash equilibrium. And same idea as before, if you don't cooperate, you play something other than Z in round one, I punish you by playing B, and I get the bad equilibrium instead in round two. So we're just to decide, should he cooperate or should he defect? So cooperate is going to mean he follows Megan's plan. 
and he plays Z in round one, Megan plays C. And then round two, we get the the good Nash equilibrium, AX. So what does Richard get out of this? Well, CZ gives him a payoff of zero. AX gives him a payoff of four. So overall he's getting four. So if he picks defect, he is refusing to follow Megan's plan. So Megan still plays C because he has to trust that Richard is going to go for it. But Richard does not follow the plan she prescribed for him. Instead, he's going to want to play X and get a payoff of 3 because that's better than get 0. So CX happens in round 1. Megan sees this and then She's going to punish it by playing B because of this bad equilibrium BY in round two. So Richard's path is going to be he gets three in round one from CX. And then around two in the bad Nash equilibrium, he gets a payoff of two. That sums to five. So as you can see, the payoff from defecting is bigger than payoff from cooperation. So it's also the point that when you have multiple Nash equilibria, cooperation can occur, but does not always occur. You gotta go check your math, check the payoffs for cooperation versus defecting, and see which one is bigger. So this brings us to a point that some students often ask me about in the past. If you have a bad Nash equilibria like BY and a good one, AX, wouldn't people just play the good one, AX, all the time? Well, that's actually not necessarily true in the real world. Bad Nash equilibria can and do occur. And there are several examples. So for measuring units, it's way easier to metric system than the U.S. system. But everyone using the U.S. system in America is a Nash equilibrium. If everyone in the grocery store is measuring things in terms of pounds, when you go to the deli, you better make your order in terms of pounds. If you try to use metric units, they're not going to understand what you mean, so that's not going to be a profitable deviation for you. So if everyone else is using U.S. system, you're going to want to also use the U.S. system, even though everyone using metric would be a better Nash equilibrium. But if you're trying to talk about the weather, everyone in America is going to talk about it in terms of Fahrenheit. If you start talking about it in terms of Celsius, we're not going to understand what you mean, so that's not going to be a beneficial deviation for you. So if everyone else is using Fahrenheit, your best response is to also use Fahrenheit. So it's a bad Nash equilibrium, but it is an equilibrium. It does occur, and we're probably going to stick with it for as far as the foreseeable future. Another bad Nash equilibrium, I heard about this one in, as a student, the computer keyboards, the QWERTY setup, you know, the keys are... Q-W-E-R-T-Y for that top row on the 
on the left. And so why do you have that rather peculiar arrangement? It would seem far more natural to do something like A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, et cetera. That makes sense. Well, it turns out that way back when people relied upon typewriters instead of computers, then typewriters often jammed if you typed too fast. So someone realized that this setup here with QWERTY, the one we use today, would slow people down and therefore make the typewriter less likely to jam. That makes no sense anymore. We don't use typewriters. We don't worry about jamming. It just slows us down. However, it is a Nash equilibrium. If you've been taught to type on a QWERTY keyboard, then going to some more efficient setup is going to involve relearning how to type. So you don't want to deviate. You don't want to try that more efficient setup because it's too costly to switch. So if everyone's using QWERTY and that's what you all learn when you learn how to type, then it's an equilibrium to keep doing that. It's a bad equilibrium, but it is an equilibrium. It does happen in real life. So don't rule out bad Nash equilibria. They are valid in theory and also valid in practice. So this wraps up with a section on finite repetitions. Come join us again for our next episode and we will talk about infinite repetitions.